do you know that you can go to jail for just talking about stocks if you tell someone about private information about a company that's not publicly disclosed? And you can also go to jail for what might seem to some uh, as a very small manipulation uh, in accounting and financial data reporting. And you can actually spend more time in jail for what I'm about to discuss than you can for manslaughter or accidentally uh, killing somebody with, with your car. And I worry about some of my retail investor heroes uh, on Reddit when it comes to GameStop and AMC. And so I wanna help you stay out of trouble. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but um, I really wanna help you before any issues might arise with any of you uh, or us trading online. Because I think the SEC and the FBI is gonna go after retail investors after going after hedge funds as well, uh, and I care. And I've been a retail investor forever. I'm an old man now, I'm like 50. I also worked uh, at hedge funds, Goldman Sachs, et cetera. I've seen a lot of bad stuff. I visit my buddies in jail and I wanna help it help you all not fall into the same trap, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about uh, the biggest um, uh, insider trading FBI investigation in history and how I humbly helped uh, my friend that was arrested by the FBI. Okay, so again, this is the, the biggest insider trading event in history. Um, I, I really do pride myself on teaching my students based on real life practical situations and, and never based on theory. And what I'll also do is I'll talk about the television show uh, Billions um, and how incredibly accurate it is when it comes to stock market fraud. And everything I, I say and do uh, is with love my heart to humbly hut, try to help to make sure that my students never get into trouble by accidentally breaking the laws when it comes to insider trading. Because nobody teaches us this stuff. And the, the people that work at these big hedge funds um, and, and you know investment banks like Goldman Sachs, they all take exams before they can do any client work or investing. Um, and they know about the insider trading laws. Uh, but my, my, my students might not know about this because where do you read about this stuff? You know, it's not taught to us. It should be taught to everybody before they open a brokerage account. And I remember um, many, many years ago uh, in the summer or late summer of 2000, I went through the Goldman Sachs training program. And what they told me was, welcome to Goldman Sachs. You, mo you, have, uh, you have more of an ability uh, to destroy value than add value to this firm. Um, please don't do anything that's gonna get the firm on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And then they fingerprinted all of us. Welcome to Goldman Sachs, right? And that was actually the right call in hindsight because um, they put the fear of God into us not, not to break the laws and whatnot. All right, so a lot of us retail investors trade stocks and, and we don't realize that we can go to jail if we manipulate certain meme stocks. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna explain how all this works and how to stay out of trouble, okay? so. I'm gonna talk about real life situations of a billionaire I met uh, when I worked in the hedge fund industry that's in jail right now. He gets out next month, I'll tell you who he is in a minute. I'll also talk about a prominent CEO of a massive software company called Computer Associates, who I also met a number of times and liked, seemed like a good guy. Uh, he went to jail for 12 years. I'll explain exactly what all these people did and how to keep yourself out of trouble. I'll also discuss and show you how I visited several jails. I'll take you inside the jails. Uh, and why I showed compassion for my friends who aren't billionaires that are in jail that violate insider trading rules. Because what happens is when you get arrested on Wall Street, you find out who your real friends are. What I'll do is I'll show you again the insides of the jails I visited. Um, and I have students actually all over the world that have spent time in jail for other reasons. And we all deserve a, a second chance. Then what I'll do is I'm gonna wrap up this topic uh, with how you can volunteer in the prison system, okay, if, if you want to, to help people that maybe had a deadbeat father uh, and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and, and yes, I do think that uh, there are far too many people that are unfairly in prison and God bless you, Kim Kardashian, for helping to make prison uh, reform reality. A reality, yeah, she's in law school now working on that. So in order to learn the insider trading rules, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a case study of a massive hedge fund uh, that was a criminal institution called Galleon. And when I worked at Goldman Sachs in New York City, 
uh, Galleon was our second largest client uh, of Goldman Sachs' equities division. The largest was a mutual fund we weren't allowed to talk about that rhymes with Ridelity. They're so powerful. And actually, when it comes to, to, to Fidelity, and this is public knowledge, when it comes to Fidelity uh, with, with IPOs, right, and Fidelity is a big mutual fund in Boston, um, they're so powerful that, and they pay so much money in commissions to, to trading floors, that in every IPO, Fidelity, it's an unwritten rule, they get twice as many shares in the IPO than the second largest uh, institutional investor. And so when I worked at Goldman, the second largest institutional investor, a hedge fund client, uh, was actually a Galleon. Now, Goldman Sachs did not do anything wrong with the Galleon scandal I'm about to talk about. So here's what happened. So there's this guy named uh, Raj Raj Rotman that ran a multi-billion dollar hedge fund called Galleon. And I actually had dinner with him once uh, at a Deutsche Bank conference in Miami in 2004. And, and we shared a cab ride home after that as well. But there was something about him, you know, an arrogance. And it, for him, it seemed like he was given off the impression that it's so easy to make money and how all of his employees are like disposable, you know, pawns in, in a chess game. So the way that hedge funds actually work is... Before the markets open in the morning, uh, they have what's called a, a morning meeting. Uh, and in this morning meeting, what they do is they discuss news that might make stocks go up or down. Okay? And this, this is a little excerpt uh, from a course of mine called the Complete Financial Analyst Course. So what happens is there are morning meetings uh, every day before the market opens, uh, where what happens is they discuss news that might make stocks go up or down. I'm trying to bring you inside the mind of of hedge funds and how it all works. Okay, so in the morning meeting, uh, you have analysts that cover different sectors like software stocks, semiconductor stocks, et cetera. And Raj Raj Rotman uh, from Galleon, uh, who gets out of jail next month after 10 years in jail, Raj Raj Rotman would literally sit in the morning meeting uh, like he's you know, the dude from the, from the movie Gladiator and he'd let his analysts argue with each other in the pit in front of him. And then he'd call out who the winner is. Uh, and the winner was often the one that did illegal things. What Raj Raj Rotman would do is he would literally ask his, uh, his semiconductor uh, uh, analyst, this is an Intel chip, he would ask his semiconductor analyst, how's the quarter going on Intel, ticker INTC? And the analyst would reply, Raj, as I mentioned in yesterday's morning meeting, Intel is tracking a bit ahead of plan for the quarter. Then Raj would interrupt and say, no, 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 no. How is the quarter going as of this morning? And that was a real conversation from a morning meeting at Galleon. And what is illegal about that is that no investor is ever allowed to know anything about how business is tracking at a publicly traded company until the company publicly discloses the information through a press release or through a publicly accessible source, uh, like a webcast, like this one here, or through a quote in the media. So if you're lining up at Starbucks one day, you know, waiting for your coffee, and some dude comes in front of you that works for Intel, for example, uh, and they say to their colleague in front of you, gosh, things are awful this quarter and we're gonna miss earnings. And then if you take that information and you trade on it, or even if you tell someone that trades on that, you can go to jail because that information is not publicly disclosed. And Martha Stewart, actually, this is crazy, but, but Martha Stewart spent time in jail because of insider trading, two years to be exact. And the real story, apparently, uh, is that when the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, when the SEC was investigating her, she was not the nicest person to the SEC, which may have caused the SEC to be not as lenient. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Let's get back to Galleon. Money certainly can be the root of all evil, and this causes many people, but not certainly all hedge fund employees, but many, uh, to violate insider trading rules. Now, with Galleon, it was so ridiculous with that it was so ridiculous that Raj Raj Rotman, um, who is like many billionaires in finance, uh, thinks he's above the law. What Raj did was he had his employees literally give bags of money to people that worked. Uh, in Silicon Valley here uh, as bribes to tell them, you know, how's the quarter going? Obviously illegal. Then Raj would literally ask his friends that were the CEOs of big companies like McKinsey 
to give them insider information. And this resulted in the CEO of consulting giant McKinsey uh, being fired. And I don't know why McKinsey gets a hall pass on this um, because they also advised Enron, ticker was e It was a big disaster back in 02. Um, and Arthur Anderson was shut down uh, and they advised as well. But McKinsey walked away. And I think one of the reasons is because McKinsey is a little bit different from other consulting firms. They give you advice and then they, they leave. Uh, versus many other consulting firms like Accenture, where I used to proudly work, um, where they, they stay on the client site and, and see it through. Okay. So when I worked at Goldman Sachs, my best friend there, a guy named Gotham Shankar, and I were in the associate training program way back in 2000. And then what happened was uh, Gotham uh, left Goldman Sachs post 9-11 as at that point in time, many companies, they cut into muscle and not into fat when over firing, you know, when the economy pulled back. So I lost touch with, with Gotham and he actually worked uh, at a firm as a trader that did business with Galleon. And, and I'll never forget this. He, he called me in 2011 when I was running my hedge fund and we reconnected after many years. And he told me he got arrested and that he needed my help. I said, of course, buddy, anything you want. And he told me what happened was he was on the phone one day uh, with a Galleon employee on the other line. Gotham worked at another hedge fund and Gotham was eating lunch. Okay. He's eating lunch one day while kind of half listening to the phone call. And he was distracted by his four computer monitors that a lot of traders have in front of them. Now on the phone, the Galleon employee passed on information to get to Gotham and Gotham didn't really remember perfectly what happened. Uh, and he took another call and, and passed on that information from the Galleon employee to the person on the other call. And, and the FBI was listening to the call. And they promptly uh, arrested my very good friend. And so Gotham called me in 2011. He said, Chris, you know, I have a newborn and a wonderful wife and the government might put me in jail. He told me it was a media frenzy. And, and when he was uh, walking with his lawyer to the trial, his lawyer would, would, would told him to, no matter what, do not make eye contact with the media photographers. I'll show you in a second, because this can show defiance, right? And so let me actually show you here uh, really, really quickly. So l let me do a search here on, on Gotham. Shankar, great guy. If you guys get to meet him one day, you'll, you'll love him. And let me go here to uh, images. And I'm going to show you myself in the news in a second as well. Let me go here just, just to Gotham. Probably a common name. Here he is here. Yeah, yeah. So here he is. Um, and that that's his lawyer on the left. This is Gotham. He's, he's looking down. This was in the New York Daily News. Not looking at the camera. Not looking at the camera. They caught him once, actually, looking at the camera. Right here. Right here. Yeah. And they tell you, look down. So it looks humbling. So to so. me. I said, of course. He said, my lawyer wants my friends to write letters to the judge to talk about my character. And I said, you got it, brother. I love you, man. So what I did was I wrote a letter and I poured my heart into it. Okay. And, and when you do this with, with uh, federal investigations, the letter is in the public domain. And I got tons of Bloomberg messages from friends uh, in the hedge fund industry when they saw the letter uh, and, and calls, people are saying to me, Chris, why would you do that? Why would you help him? What's the upside? And I said, the upside is compassion and everybody deserves a second chance. And my favorite students of mine are the ones that are poor, smart, and hungry, and often those that have had a setback in life. And, and I hope as we discuss this case that you're humbly learning uh, the insider trading rules. Now, let me proudly share with you um, my name alongside Gotham's uh, in that Bloomberg article when I was quoting uh, standing up for him. So let me, let me show you that. And you guys can do a search as well and, and see me uh, alongside uh, Gotham here. So let's go to Gotham, Shankar, Chris, Harwin, Harun, Harun. So here's a Bloomberg article here. Galleon Insider Figure Gets Probation After Lean Sleep Bed. Okay. And you can read this if you will, uh, if you want to as well. If, if I search for my name here, uh, I wrote here, let me make it bigger so y'all could see it. Gotham and I were in the training program together at Goldman Sachs. Uh, if I could summarize his character in five words, it would be as follows. Ethical, kind, minimalist, selfless, and generous. He's a great guy, and I proudly stood, stood, for him, stood up for him there. Now, the FBI was fair with him uh, because he helped them, which was the right call. 
If your boss or anyone on the phone tries to influence you to break the law when it comes to insider information, I want you to say this. I, I don't feel comfortable with this conversation. And I've used that on more than one occasion. I'll never tell you which hedge fund it was. Then what you do next is you report the conversation to your compliance department if one exists in your firm. And you will not get fired for doing that. And if you do, uh, then the firm could get shut down or materially fined. And if you work at a finance company, then they will promptly put the stock you had information on on what's called the restricted list for at least a month, meaning nobody in the department or potentially firm-wide can transact uh, in that company. The alternative of not doing this is that it will hurt your career much more in the long run. Um, if you work in a non-finance firm, I should say also, uh, please talk to your boss or human resources if you hear something or accidentally say something. And as Warren Buffett said, it takes 30 years to build a reputation and only 30 seconds to ruin it. And one of the only things that you take with you from job to job or career to career is your reputation. And so you got to be careful about insider information. Never share anything with anybody that you think might be insider information related. Now, I visited another friend of mine in jail who was arrested by the FBI for insider trading. Good guy. Here's what the jail actually looks like uh, on the inside. Okay, so this is a, a five-hour drive uh, uh, from where I live right now. It's called the, the Taft Correctional Facility. And it's silly, but people actually call white-collar crime jails club fed. Um, it's not maximum security. And what happens at these jails is... Um, the inmates can walk around even in the parking lots and they wear colors that we as visitors aren't allowed to wear. You know, it's, it's, it, it's kind of club fed or is, is kind of like a low end Ramada. Now, billionaire Raj Raj Rotman, Raj Rotman uh, was sentenced to jail for 11 years. He gets out in July next month. If you're watching the replay, the year is 2021. So why is it that many billionaire hedge funds get into trouble? I mean, they're already billionaires. Uh, why break the law? And the reason is because uh, many, but not all of them, but many of them become billionaires by breaking the law. You know, once a cheater, always a cheater. Now, I'm definitely a capitalist, but I do think our legal system is far too lenient when it comes to certain Wall Street billionaires. You know, quite often these billionaires, many of which I've met, Quite often, these billionaires protect themselves by having their army of analysts around them do the dirty work of finding insider information. And these billionaires have all of their inbound and outbound emails checked by a moat or an army of lawyers so that they're protected. And so you need to tell them, you know, if, if, if you're a, a pawn of an analyst, if you work for them, you need to tell them, I'm not comfortable with this conversation because they will sacrifice you in a heartbeat. Okay, now, not all hedge fund billionaires are corrupt, but lots of them are. And, and many of them donate a lot of money to politicians, which gives them a get-out-of-jail-free card. Well, I'm proud to say I have a get-into-jail-free card to help those unfairly imprisoned. Now, when I worked in the hedge fund industry, I was always very, very ethical. And did it potentially hurt my earnings? Probably. But I remember times when friends of mine in the hedge fund industry would ask me questions in a certain way, and I knew for sure they were being recorded. So what I'll do is I'll leave it at that, and I'm happy to answer questions about that topic if you're interested. Separately, let's talk about accounting and finance crimes. I also worked at a very big hedge fund years ago that was very ethical called Citadel, and their compliance department was off the charts. It was awesome. And I'm proud that I worked there. But when I worked there, the company hired former CIA and FBI veterans to teach us how to tell if a CEO is lying. The answer is when they move their lips. Sorry, that was a bad joke. But they hired FBI and CIA, former FBI and CIA veterans to tell us, teach us how to tell if a CEO is lying. And the case study that we did during that training session was we watched interviews uh, of the former CEO uh, of, of computer associates uh, named uh, Sanjay Gupta. And I had dinner with Sanjay years ago, and I thought he was a good guy. However, by watching the interviews, 
you could tell he was lying. So the way it works is when companies report earnings, they report them quarterly to investors. And each quarter, of course, has 90 days. And if the company thinks that they're going to miss revenue targets for the quarter before it ends, then they have all their salespeople work tremendously hard to see if they can close business fast. Now, this next thing I'm going to tell you is fascinating. Many hedge funds rent satellites and they rent these satellites to count cars in the parking lots of publicly traded companies in the last couple of days of each quarter, especially if it's, if it's a, a weekend. Because if there's a large number of cars in the parking lots, um, this could indicate that the company is going to potentially miss the revenue targets. And, and companies more often than not can make their earnings targets, but they can miss revenue targets easily because what the CFO can do is the CFO can suspend travel for the last week of a quarter in order to manage earnings, right? To save money. And that is ethical and it happens all the time. What is unethical and criminal is if one day after the quarter ends, if the CFO or salespeople change the date on the receipts from the first day of next quarter to the last day of the previous quarter, okay? And this is what Sanjay Gupta from Computer Associates uh, did, and that's why he went to jail. And we used to always joke on Wall Street when I was short Computer Associates that the company has 35 days in the last month of each quarter. So here are ways to tell if someone is lying. If somebody breaks eye contact with you when they're answering a question, okay? So I look down sometimes, it's just my, my demeanor. But if you ask somebody an answer to a yes or no question and they look away as they answer it, there is a chance they may be lying. Okay, that's just one of four. You need at least two of four to be correct, to correct, to maybe assume somebody's lying. Okay. The second thing is they touch their face, you know, more often than, than usual. Okay, that, that, that could be um, a reason that, that they're trying to cover something up. Like people do this sometimes too over their mouth. It, it's subconscious, but it, it's human nature. The third thing of four is they, um, they, they ramble like crazy, okay? They ramble like crazy when answering a question, like asking a kid, uh, did you take that cookie from the cookie jar? No, how could I? I mean, the, the, the ladder to get the cookie jar is over there and it, it's, it's kind of heavy. I carried it earlier. I mean, it's kind of heavy. There's no way I can figure that out. It's, you get it, you get it. And the last thing, the fourth thing to tell, a way to tell if somebody is lying um, is, is if they start shaking their foot uh, or their hand. Okay, so it could be because they had too much caffeine, I don't know, but that's what a lie detector test does, right? Remember the movie Meet the Parents with Robert De Niro and Ben Stiller, right? They attach it to you to see if you're lying, yeah. Now, before I talk about the TV show Billions and its accuracy, I wanna talk about another prison that I visited many times to help poor 20-something-year-old men that have uh, deadbeat fathers. Uh, and you know maybe they were caught doing something at the wrong time, which, to be honest, could have been could have been me easily, easily. I don't think there's such thing as a deadbeat mother. So this prison I visit a lot. It's, it's right here by Oracle's headquarters uh, in Redwood City. Uh, it's called the McGuire Correctional Facility, and it's a more secure prison than than Club Fed. And I volunteered there to help, as everybody deserves a second chance. And too many people are unfairly imprisoned. And, and again, God bless Kim Kardashian for for working on prison reform. So what I did was I got the police department to do a thorough background check on me through the St. Vincent de Paul charity. And when you visit, you have to go through many security security checks, of course, with cameras and multiple doors. Um, and what I would do is I would talk to inmates. And one dude actually uh, said he was in jail for selling marijuana, which, of course, is legal now. He told me this. He said, if you get caught selling weed in San Francisco, you know, all you get is a slap on the wrist. But because he sold marijuana on federal property in San Francisco, in a, in a very small part of the city called the Presidio, where George Lucas and Peter Thiel have offices, because he sold weed on that federal property, the Presidio in San Francisco, um, he actually is in jail for 10 years, which is certainly not fair. And so I volunteered at the McGuire Correctional Facility, uh, and it actually looks like this on the inside. And I did it on Sundays. And... This is not a religious thing at all, but I used to be terrified of public speaking. And 
you need to always run to your fears in business because your competition also has the same fears, I promise you, and they'll run away from it. You got to run to your fears and embrace it. And so when it comes to public speaking, um, I, I'd rather die than give a speech the way I used to be. But one Sunday I was in the prison system and usually there's, there's a priest that goes in with you and the priest wasn't there that one Sunday. Okay. And what, the way it works is when, when you go into the prison system uh, through a not-for-profit, and there's many charities, uh, different religions, et cetera, uh, religious institutions where you can get it. But what happens is on a Sunday, there's a, a church service, right? And I'll never forget this because the priest wasn't there, right? And so um, what I did was I went into uh, one of these rooms here. You, you could see it actually here, uh, one of these smaller rooms through a door there. And I, I was given a pamphlet and I was supposed to read it. And I was so scared, man. I was standing up there uh, and there were 30 inmates in that room in orange jumpsuits and they had their arms crossed, right? Uh, it was terrifying, terrifying. And some of them had tattoos saying F you right here. It, it, was, it was nutty. So they're looking at like, they're like, who the hell are you? And so I, I was reading the pamphlet and what happens in church and all religious institutions is the priest, rabbi, whatever, reads um, something from the text, right? The, 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 the New Testament in this case. And then after the, the priest reads it, the priest gives a speech and the priest has all week long to prepare for this. I didn't have, I didn't have any time to prepare for it. So I read from the gospel. It was a, a passage about hope uh, and faith and confidence. And I had to give the speech about that. I was terrified, dude. And, and when you're up there and your knees are shaking, Nobody sees your knees shaking. Nobody sees that you're nervous. You only feel it. I promise you. Uh, and so uh, I was supposed to give a speech. And, and so I, I just kind of winged it. And what I said kind of changed my life because it, it helped me conquer my fear of public speaking. And so, uh, and, and dude, if you want to learn public speaking, like the scariest place to do it is a prison system. And so I said this to the inmates. They're all sitting there like this. I said, do you believe in God? And a bunch of them said, Yeah. And I said, does God believe in you? And they said, yes. And I said, well, if you don't believe in yourself, then you might have to question your faith. And at that point, the arms uncrossed and people are like, huh, yeah. And, and so for me, that, that was the, the turning point in my life when it comes to public speaking. Run to your fears and condition yourself to enjoy your fears. So now that we know what these prisons look like and how to visit uh, your friends to help others that are unfairly you know, put in the prison system, what I want to do is I want to now talk about the TV show Billions and how incredibly accurate it is. And one of the writers and creators is this brilliant dude named Andrew Ross Sorkin. Okay? And he was actually one of the creators of, of Billions. He's an amazing journalist. He does his work, but he also made the best business movie ever about what happened in 2008 called Too Big to Fail. Watch that movie, please. And the billionaire in the show Billions, played by Brody from Homeland, who's British in real life, uh, the billionaire in the show Billions is called ba Bobby Axelrod. And many of the episodes actually in Billions chronicle real criminal situations that billionaire hedge fund managers committed crimes. And in the hedge fund community, we all know who the real life criminals are and what situations are they're talking about. The show is so accurate to the, to the extent that the what the analysts wear is is accurate too. You know, it, it, usually on, on on Wall Street or at least these these hedge funds, people wear the, the these coats that these these things that look like this. If you watch it, it's actually a good way to understand what not to do in finance. You know, kind of like the movie, uh, like the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas from '87, um, or or The Wolf of Wall Street. Now. When it comes to the psychiatrist in the show, I'm going to get hot with this, I need to get off. When it comes to the psychiatrist uh, in, in the show, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's actually accurate, right? Because many, many hedge funds actually have, built, have, uh, have psychiatrists on site. Uh, and I worked for a hedge fund in New York City uh, where they have one on site uh, every now and then called Kingdom Capital. But this, this actress here, uh, Maggie Siff, uh, she plays a psychiatrist. And uh, she actually used to work at a hedge fund. Uh, and Tony Robbins trained her on how to play that psychiatrist role. Uh, and the show is incredibly well-researched and, and multidimensional as well. Now, in terms of Paul Giamatti, um, uh, who's, who's, I think his dad was uh, the 
the head of uh, at baseball, um, Bartlett Giamatti, passed away, God bless him. But in terms of, of Paul Giamatti uh, as a district attorney in the show Billions, his character is a bit extreme in the show, but his character is actually based on Preet Bharara uh, for the ethical stuff and Elliot Spitzer for the unethical stuff. And Preet Bharara is, is actually one of my heroes. He's one of my heroes because he prosecuted and investigated the mafia, Al-Qaeda, uh, and and Russian money launderers actually back in 2013. In fact, he's not allowed to enter Russia anymore. He also prosecuted about 100 Wall Street criminals, including Raj Raj, Raj, Raj Rotman. Uh, and, and I actually wish that, that Preet was still working for the government, as there are a lot of criminal bankers that got bailed out in 2008, that gave themselves record bonuses in 2010, while many Americans lost their houses. Not fair. And I'd love to see a massive tax on the banks that got bailed out um, with the use of proceeds to help Americans that lost their houses in 2008. Now, Preet won 85 Wall Street insider trading convictions in a row. It's unbelievable. And he was so passionate and so good at his job that maybe that's the reason he's no longer in that position. The last thing I'll say is that if you transact in stocks, and if you think there's a small chance you could get into trouble by driving up or down certain stocks like GameStop or AMC, please be careful. Because I think the SEC and the FBI will be looking into stock manipulation regardless of if you work at a hedge fund or you're one of my retail hero investors on Reddit. Thanks.